Sam and I started this like four months ago and it was about the time when a bunch of companies were starting to do hiring freezes and just um, do a bunch of layoffs. So we both recognized that it was already pretty crazy getting your first job as a developer, um, whether you're making a like a career transition or if you are like straight out of college or something. So we just wanted to try to help you all as much as we could and started doing these AMAs. Um, and so how it works is, Sam, I know you already posted the Slido link. It's like the very first uh, link in our Jitsi chat here. So that's a great place to put the questions that you'd like us to answer. Um, and then if you end up having any sort of like follow-up questions, then you can put those in the Jitsi chat. Or if we end up talking about resources that we can link to, links can go in the Jitsi chat too. Um, I think that's all I need to say about the meetup itself. So I'm Brady and I work at Trunk Club, um, Nordstrom Trunk Club now, and I have worked there for almost three years. I went to a coding boot camp back in 2017, and this has been my first job straight out of boot camp. Um, when I when I was in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I ended up studying Spanish and then I minored in Italian and then I graduated and moved to a German speaking country. So I knew that I really liked learning spoken languages and then it took me a while to realize that computer languages were really fun too. Um, so that is why I went to a boot camp. I really hadn't thought about doing computer science stuff until someone helped me make that connection between computer languages and spoken languages. Um, so I have been doing for the past year or so, it's been mostly front end work. I'm officially full stack, but uh, my focus has pretty much been on the front end. So lots of JavaScript, TypeScript, React. Um, and then we use a tool called Rebass. Uh, that's enough about me. I'll let Sam take over and then we can hear from our special guest, Ryan. Hey, what's up, everybody? Um... I'm in Denver right now still, for the people who were here last week. <laughs> uh, I never made it to Wyoming yet. Uh, had a little weather incident, it snowed. Um, but it's back to 80 degrees again. But anyways, <laughs> I'm a front-end developer at Lyft. Um, I work in a mapping organization. I build internal tools um, uh, for the anybody in the mapping organization. Um, uh, I had a crazy path to get here. I studied computer science, got a degree a long time ago, 2002. Never used a degree, um, did a bunch of other stuff, worked in the mortgage industry until that blew up in 2008. Then I went to West Africa, I joined the Peace Corps for three years, uh, came back and that's when I went to coding boot camp to try and actually get my first job um, coding. So I went to Dev Boot Camp uh, in 2013 when I came back from the Peace Corps. And then I actually broke into the industry on my second attempt this time. Um, I did a whole bunch of stuff. First thing I did was try to start a startup. Uh, well, my friend was trying to start a startup and I just, um, he asked me to help him build some stuff. And that never worked out. I did contract work. Eventually got my first full-time job. I think it was almost a year after I graduated boot camp. Between nine months and a year. I don't know. My memory is really bad. I rely on Google Calendar. <laughs> I gotta go look it up. Um yeah, and then I worked at another startup and then a couple other companies and now I'm at Lyft. So yeah, that's the TLDR of my windy long path to getting to where I am right now. <laughs> um Let's get Ryan on. He's our special guest this week. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yep. now we can. All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, thank you, Brady and Sam, for inviting me onto this talk. Um, I'll give you like a little bit of background on me. So I found my way into software um, 
as a non-technical person. Um, I took an interest in uh, writing code when I was working at an education technology startup in Chicago called uh, Bench Prep. Um, and it was a very small uh, technical team. So I wasn't able to um, get a ton of mentoring and attention from those engineers, but that was kind of where I started writing some HTML and JavaScript and um, just like basic web uh, technology stuff. Um, but I eventually landed as an apprentice at uh, early 2015. And I uh, was at Trunk Club. Um, I started out as an apprentice, which was a six month program. And then I became a software engineer after that. And then I stayed at Trunk Club until uh, early November of last year, uh, at which point I uh, said goodbye to all my great coworkers there and um, started off uh, on my own doing some uh, freelance work and consulting and um, sort of uh, catching up on all of the uh, personal projects that I had uh, started uh, or conceived while I was working at Trunk Club but didn't have the time. So that, um, that about uh, sums up my life story uh, and that's the 60 second version anyway. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, that's kind of me and where I've been. What were you doing um, at that edtech startup before you started coding? Um, I started there doing. Um, I started there as like an intern, so I I started as a marketing intern. Actually, um, my degree was in uh, business, um, and so I started out in the mar with the marketing team, and then. I moved into more of a sales role um, towards the end. And so I was selling our uh, test prep product at the time. Um, and so what got me interested uh, was just working with the developers every day and seeing and understanding like how they uh, built that product. And that's that process was was so fascinating to me that that was kind of the the catalyst to to get me interested because, um, I mean, there was a computer science program at uh, Loyola, which is where I went to school, but it was it was a, a world away from from my interests at that time. So it wasn't even on my radar as something that I could do or or, or study. So it was really only when I got into uh, the working world that I that I fell into technology. So Sam was curious if you had started coding while you were at the ed tech company, although I don't need to translate anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was I was writing some code there. Um, it was just tiny little pieces, um, learning on my own, building little tiny toy applications. Um, I was doing some like markup and I was doing some just basic basic markup uh, that was being deployed to production, but nothing, nothing substantial. Um, it was just difficult in such a small team um, for me to to contribute. Um, but I, I was vigilant and I was learning as best as I could on my own, um, sort of after work, before work, whenever I could. Um, and the developers there were a great resource for my questions. Like as I was going through tutorials and stuff like that, like they would help out. Um, but it was hard for them to to work with me as like uh, a member of the team, if that makes any sense. Sweet. All right, we can start on the slide of questions, Brady. All right, cool. Um, do you have any advice for specific projects or groups that people can get involved in to gain experience and network while doing the job search? Um, specific projects or groups? That is a great question. I think, um, I would say that my, my, my best, uh, my best thought on that is if there are any projects or app ideas that you have that you yourself want, or that you yourself would benefit from, um, I would focus on trying to build that because 
you might not have many collaborators at first, but there's a decent chance that what you're working on might interest somebody else, especially somebody else who's in your shoes as well. And you could find collaborators that way. You could, it gives you something to talk to other people about. And then I think most importantly, what it does is you're going to run into problems and you're going to run into things that you don't know how to do yourself, but you have this really rich context to ask questions with. And you can actually build rapport with people online and other developers who help you out. Um, and I think that that's a great way because what, one thing I found is like doing working on projects that are not paid, obviously, that I'm like not personally motivated to use and to benefit from, sometimes it can be hard to motivate yourself to work on them. And I found, at least with some of those myself, um, it's hard to stay motivated and to keep working on it. Um, but I found that if you are really, really interested in this little thing that you're building, you're going to think about it a lot. You're going to think about it in the morning when you wake up. You're going to think about it at night when you go to bed. Um, and so trying to find something that um, you that you really want to exist, I think, is probably, that's where I would start. Um, and, and in fact, when, when quarantine started and everyone was kind of locked indoors, I had a lot of spare time on my hands. And I ended up just, I just started working on building um, a project that I wanted to exist. And um, I didn't even have to get myself to work on it. I just was naturally motivated to keep building it, to keep adding to it, adding features, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, that's probably, that's the first thing that comes to mind, I would say, for that one. What was that project that you built? Um, so that one was, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a note-taking application um, that was kind of similar to just a plain text note-taking app, except that um, whenever I would add a new note, it would add, it would create a flashcard for that note, and it would place that flashcard into a review deck, and so. Over time, as I'm adding to my notes, um, I don't just forget about them and they don't just kind of like go away and go stale. I'm constantly, every time I open that application, I get um, a quick digest of like all of the notes that I've added recently and then even notes that I've added like far away in the past. Um, it, it's kind of like a, a dual flashcard slash note taking app uh, all in one. Um, which definitely did not exist at the time. <laughs> it's kind of a weird. <laughs> it's kind of a weird app, um, but that's why I like it as an example of something to work on. Is because, um, especially someone who's prospecting or looking for work opportunities, it's just great, great material for conversation. Um, if you're able to work on something for like four months or, you know a very extended period of time and it, it does a lot of different things and it kind of, it does like unique things. Um, developers are, they're, they're always interested in side projects. They always want to hear, you know, what, what's your angle on this? Like, you know, if, if it's a to-do list app, like what makes that to-do list app special? Um, stuff like that, I think is, is a great, uh, is a great thing to, to work on. Yeah. We've, We've brought stuff kind of like this up a couple of times in our in the meetups, how anytime, especially if you're in an interview, if you can talk about this thing that you actually care about, like it shows in your face that you're excited about this. And that does so much for the interview process as a whole. It makes people realize how excited you are about code and about working mm -hmm. on projects. And it's only going to help you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think if you're if you're reaching out for help online, if you even just like a one sentence context about like, hey, I'm I'm trying to build this this app, you know, for myself, I think that I think that really excites people to help you. Like I think if you if you're saying, hey, I'm stuck on this like, you know, homework question from this like textbook that you've never heard of, like, okay, that's one thing. But if you're saying, like, hey, I'm trying to build this 
this thing that like scrapes data from this website and, and builds a dashboard for, you know, this group that I'm a part of, like, that's kind of cool. So like people, people want things, people want things to exist in the world that people are excited about. So I think it's, it's a, it's an extra edge on, on getting help too, if you ever get stuck. Nice. Uh, so as a self-taught developer, what were ways to keep yourself motivated while also working on other projects and working with others on projects? Like, are there any side projects that you grew most from working on? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so when I, when I was working on, when I was trying to, to learn, when I was trying to teach myself all of these different skills, it got, at times it got very hard to stay motivated because there were times when I felt so lost and confused. And it's one thing if you're feeling lost and confused, but it's another thing if that, if that feeling of confusion starts to morph into feeling like I'm not cut out for this or this won't, you know, this just isn't going to work out for me. Um, so that was really tough. And um, sometimes I still deal with stuff like that. But I think um, the first, the first like real quote unquote project that I did was actually not coding based. It was, I was reading a book and the book was called Code, um, one word, C-O-D-E, Code. It's by uh, Charles Petzold. And it's a fascinating book. It's like one of my favorite books ever. Um, and it was my, it was one of my first like really intense uh, projects about, um, about learning like how computers work. And it was very difficult. And I read, I read all the way through the book once and I felt like I understood about 30% of it. So I reread that book two more times. Um, and towards the end of that project, I, um, I told myself, if I can explain this, if I can explain this to someone else, then that's like evidence that I will, that I'm learning basically. So I pulled in a friend of mine who's kind of also interested and we ended up doing this thing every week where we would meet up and I would basically teach him what I had learned from that book. Um, and that was like, that made everything <laughs> so much better because it's like, it just, it, it helped me stay focused on, you know, okay, if I don't, if I don't learn this well enough, then I'm not going to be able to explain it. Um, to my friend Ed, and so that was kind of um, that was kind of what what turned the switch on that, and then and then that just kind of became a, a go to sort of tool for me as the years went on, which was like if I'm really struggling to understand something, like let me find someone who I can explain it to, and and when I started at Trunk Club, every single person around me knew way more than I did, and so it actually became even more fun because I would explain what I was learning to people who already knew it 10 times better than me. But that was awesome because like inevitably, you know, 10 minutes in it would, the, the, you know, the tables would turn and then they would be teaching me. So it was, it kind of became this catalyst for, uh, this catalyst for trying to learn things, not just so that I understand them, but, learn them and internalize them in a way that I can just speak about them out loud, which is actually, uh, those are two different things. Um, and I think doing it the second way really rounds out the way that you understand it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that was also yeah. a very, very long rambling answer to that question. So <laughs> I agree with that too. When I was, um, after I did that boot camp, uh, I did a lot of, uh, I mentored, at Dev Bootcamp, I TA'd at General Assembly for one of the front end courses. I volunteered at Mission Bit teaching middle school kids how to code. All wow. that stuff, like having to figure out like how to teach a middle school kid JavaScript. Wow. All, <laughs> or like even just, uh, I did Rails Bridge. Uh, I used to teach pe um, people how to do Ruby on Rails. Um, 
and it does help you learn the material a lot better because like you want to make sure you explain it to the people correctly or sometimes you since i was a noob sometimes i would explain it incorrectly and then oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> then find out be like oh remember that thing i told you never mind i found out that that's not correct um oh, yeah. but yeah it really helps because like you have to really dig in and like try to make sure you understand it so you can figure out how to explain it to other people. Yeah, yeah if anyone, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, even at even at Trunk Club, I when you know I was a bit further along there, um, I started mentoring um, more entry level engineers. And even then when I would, when we would sit down to pair or I would explain something, I would always caveat with, okay, there, there's actually like a, a decent chance that this is wrong. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to explain it, and then if if you or I at some point figure out what's really going on, let's let's explain that back to each other. Um, so because yeah, there's there's no way to know everything about everything. Like your your the map is never the territory. Like there's always more stuff. Um, but what you've condensed and internalized can can help you uh, get your job done, and so. As you get more advanced, you're you're always just adding just a little bit more to your your mental model. Um, so yeah, you're technically always technically always uh, inaccurate, um, which is a good thing to remember. And if anyone is looking for people who are newer at code, I've discovered in the past couple of months there are a ton of Facebook pages for like coding for newbies, and um, people are always asking questions there. And Twitter is full of people asking questions, so. Uh, wherever you're at, I'm sure you would be able to turn around and start helping other people if you're interested. Yeah, even the platforms like um, Treehouse. Treehouse has like all these forums and like people just asking questions like they're stuck and you can just help them out. A lot of them are like just beginning. So you, you, you know more than them probably. So then jumping into the next question, uh, specifically during your apprenticeship at Trunk Club, what was the aspect of that apprenticeship that led to the greatest growth in your coding skills? Ooh, great question. Okay, for me, For me personally, learning learning React actually um, probably had the most impact because when I started there, my first two months, I was only doing backend. I was only writing Ruby code on the backend, and all of the work that I was assigned was very very specific detailed like bug tickets and like really tiny features. And so I would go in and I would learn like just a little bit here and a little bit there, but nothing, it didn't quite feel like I had this holistic like capability um, until I sat down to, to learn React, which was a part of my apprenticeship was to create a front end application. And so that, um, was incredibly hard uh, because I also had to learn JavaScript at the same time. I had never written any JavaScript. And so I was kind of, you know, churning through tutorials and resources, trying to like pick up different aspects of it. And it took a very long time. But once that started to click and I started to be able to develop like a mental model for like what's happening. So it's like if I add this, and click that, what's gonna happen? When I first started, I would have no idea. I would have to look it up or I would have to just click it and see. Um, and there were a lot of bugs and you know nothing was quite working, but um, eventually once that all started to work, I started to get this cohesion and I could start to like, you know, fit those pieces together. And then once I, once I had understood what it means to have a mental model for something, I went over to the back end and I said, how can I, how can I make this back end 
on how can I make it work in my mind the way I understand how a React app works? And I had no idea. And so I just started working on that mental model for the back end. And like, you know, how how does a request get from the endpoint down into the database and back up again? Um, and I started to kind of see that as like kind of a similar pattern as as how props might flow through different components. And so I started like making these analogies and that was when things started to click was when I started to like compare my mental models of like how a React app was working versus how a Sinatra, a Ruby Sinatra app was working. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes if that makes sense, but that was kind of like, I think learning React was probably what did it for me. Um, but maybe to like make that more general, I would say like picking picking something that has like reasonably well defined boundaries and just like mastering it and learning everything that you possibly can about it. Um, once you have that, you can make you can like make connections to other things. Kind of like how they say that if you you know if you learn piano, then you can then it's easy to pick up guitar. Um, for for me, learning React was like the thing that helped me understand everything else. Um, maybe maybe not everyone has that same uh, experience with it, but when you think about what React really is, it's basically it's basically just functional programming. So it's just like it React like brings in these like very core abstract concepts that apply. Um, up and down the whole stack, and it just it focuses on those few like those few concepts like single direction data flow, um, and that was kind of what made it click. I think I should I yeah. should give myself a timer so that I can only spend like <laughs> two minutes answering the question. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Um, so, did you had you learned Ruby was your first language? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, there, there were there were some languages like I learned a, a couple languages early, early on that was just a result of like the textbook that I picked up was like, OK, this is the language that we're going to use. And so I would kind of learn it. I didn't really know. I, did, I had not mastered any specific language when I started as an apprentice. I just kind of knew a little bit of this. I knew a little bit of that. Um, I kind of applied with an iOS application that I had written um, because I took the iTunes U, uh, the iOS programming course that was a, a Stanford course, um, which was unnecessarily hard uh, and was not the first thing I should have done. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, this was like 2013 and 2014, and uh, I just was just reading blog posts, and I'd read a blog post that said, Hey, this course is really great, and so I would say, "Oh, cool!" And I would just go do that, and I would have like very, very mixed uh, success with with that approach. But yeah, I think once I got into Trunk Club, like Ruby was kind of the first language that I really learned uh, end to end, and then JavaScript almost at the exact same time. <laughs> so yeah, I had a very, very disorganized. Uh, a very disorganized, chaotic uh, on ramp um, to the profession. It's just kind of lots of lots of trying lots of different things, um, and then eventually it started to stick. <laughs> how did you end up at that apprenticeship at Trunk Club? Like, how did you find out about it, and like, what what made you apply to it? Yeah, so I had been. Um, I decided that I so I at first I didn't even know apprenticeships existed. I my original goal was to be be, be hired as a programmer. Um, and so when I started doing that, I I, re, I actually distinctly remember it was January, it was January of 2015 and my my new year's resolution was uh, was get a job um, as a developer. And I specifically remember I had 
a coffee, I had a coffee meeting in the morning and I had a lunch meeting during lunch and I had like drinks after work meeting, uh, after work every single day for like three weeks. And it was the most intense, most intense networking I'd ever done in my life. But what was great about it was that I was, I already knew a lot of people from the startup world because of being, having worked at bench prep, which was um, at the time bench prep was located in the kind of co-working space that, um, that their, one of their investors light bank had set up. And so there were like, there were probably maybe 10 startups in there. And, and just by virtue of being around, you would kind of get to know different people. And so when I set out to do this, I called, um, I called people from all over. And so my first, my first couple were just people that I had already, that I already knew. And so I would meet with them and I would kind of tell them, you know, this is what I'm going for. And they would always say, they would always say, Oh, you know, I don't really, I, I, we're not hiring. I don't have any opportunities for you, but, uh, but Hey, you should, uh, you know, my friend, um, works over here and like, maybe they're hiring. I'll, I'll connect you. Um, so by their, by their generous connections, I was able to just keep leapfrogging around until, um, I, I landed, uh, with actually a former colleague from bench prep who had, he was an engineer and he had worked, he had, uh, gone over to trunk club. And so he was working at trunk club and it was when I was meeting with him that he said, um, you know, uh, we have an apprentice program. And that was the first time I'd even heard the word apprentice, um, uh, in that context. And so that was when I learned about it. And then I ended up applying there. Um, and, uh, that was, that was how I found, that was how I kind of got that job. It took a very, very long time. Um, but it all, it all worked out in the end, I think. And then how long were these coffee talks usually that you set up with people? Um, well that part, I would say, I mean, it varied. I think the most, probably the funniest one was like, Oh, you don't have time to meet. Well, I'll just walk with you from, you know, <laughs> I'll just walk with you. There was one guy who would, he would commute, he's commuting in the suburbs and I met him outside the office after work and I just walked with him to the train station. And that took, that was from 600 West to union station. So that was like a good 25 minutes. Um, it was a little distracted, but, uh, it, you know, at the end, as long as you, as long as you, uh, you make a connection with somebody and, and they, you know, they understand like what you're trying to do. That's it's worth it. So, um, did he yeah, offer it, to it, talk so, to you on his commute or were you like, Oh, really? You don't have time, but what about your walk? To the no, he, yeah. He was like, no, I, I don't, he was, I, I think I pitched it as like, let's get a beer after work. And he's like, no, I have to go. I, I have to go back, but like, you can walk with me. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, it probably helped that when when I had when I was at bench prep before, I was doing sales. So in my mind, I had this very like pre-made strategy, which was like you know just reach out to people. And actually, the probably the best story was uh, there's this one guy. Um, his name was Dan, and he was uh, he was very hard to get a hold of. And so I remember in when I was doing sales, I learned that just because they don't reply doesn't mean that they're not interested. It just means that they ignored you. Um, and those two are different. And so if you, you can reply like several more times until they come back at you and say, you know, please stop bothering me um, or no, I'm not interested. Um, and so I kept emailing this guy and then I emailed him like three times and then he finally replied and he was like, yes, Ryan, it's great to hear from you. Of course, I remember you. Um, yes, I'd love to get lunch. You just let me know when. And I was like, sweet. And so I was like, let's do Chipotle right by where you work. Um, you know, does next Wednesday work? And he just goes to me. Um, and so I replied back again, maybe, maybe two more times. And this guy was an iOS developer. And I, at the time I was, I thought that I wanted to be an iOS developer. So I was like, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let this guy get away. So at, at one point I just sent a calendar invite for Chipotle at lunch. 
and he accepted. <laughs> but he never replied to my email, but he accepted my, my calendar invite. So I was like, okay. And then, you know, the, t the day comes, I, I go to Chipotle, I, I sit down, I reserve a table, and um, he doesn't show up. And so I reply to the calendar invite saying, hey, Dan, I'm at Chipotle. Do you want me to order something for you? And he replies back. He's like, oh, my God, I completely forgot. No, don't order for me yet. I'll be right back. I'll be right down. And then he like came down like five minutes later. So I was like, yes. And that that showed me that if you just keep bothering people, eventually they will uh, they will they will get back to you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So I also like just to point out what you did. Um, I was always told that the fewer decisions you give for the other person, the more likely they are. So you yep. like told him where, you told him when. He didn't even have to reply. It was just like click yes, yep. <laughs> and then reminding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I al I always provide like um, one main option for people to pick when I code email them. I pick like, I say like, how does this, does this work for you? If not, here's a couple other options. Um, that way it makes it super easy. They just, a lot of the time they just say, yes, that works. Let's do it. <laughs> exactly. I'm actually looking up to see if I can find this old email thread. <laughs> but yeah, so, so you, totally just did all networking did you even apply to like jobs like or were you just networking or were you doing both um that's a good question so i was not applying directly i was not um when i first want when i wanted to get into startups i i i, I did a lot of applying and I probably applied to maybe a hundred different places over like, I was working at the time, I was working this like night shift, uh, this overnight job. Um, we were actually, it was actually this contracting gig and it was like digitizing the Oprah catalog <laughs> uh, out, in, out in one of the Northwest suburbs in Chicago. And so I was like, when I would just be working there, I would just have my laptop and I would just apply, apply, apply. Um, and it's just, it was, I just had very little success with that. Um, so, cause I, I just had no experience and I, I wasn't even like, I had, hadn't even started learning how to, to code at that point. Um, so um, it just seemed like a less uh, inviting approach. I'm sure if my, if I if I hadn't of gotten the opportunity at Trunk Club within like within a month, I definitely would have probably started applying just to like increase my my reach. Um, but I was lucky enough within a couple of weeks to find uh, something um, that I was really interested in, which was Trunk Club. Um, and so once I got, I believe I scheduled the interview for Trunk Club. I think two weeks out, and I studied all day, uh, every day for like that whole time, and probably way over prepared. Um, and and this, the interview still just went so poorly. Um, it's, a, it's a miracle that they, <laughs> that they, hi that they hired me. So, um, but yeah, once I, like if I hadn't, um, if I hadn't have, have reached Trunk Club, I probably would have started applying. Um, what was the interview process like? For the apprenticeship um so fun story there uh, i actually applied as a developer um because i think in my like i don't know if they if they brought all apprentices through as developers or if they or if i made a mistake but um in any case i think half my interviewers thought that i was like an experienced developer so that was interesting um uh, yeah, it was basically, there was a lunch session where, uh, two engineers took me out to lunch and we just kind of got to know each other and, and I talked about my background and stuff like that. And then we had two coding interviews 
and then two architecture interviews. And I think that might've been it. Um, so it was like pair programming and then there was like whiteboarding and stuff. Um, although they didn't, they, um, they said that I didn't have to use a whiteboard, but it was there if I if I wanted to use it. Um, and so the coding interviews they went okay because um, that was like what I had mostly prepared for was like, and I didn't study like algorithm questions. Um, I didn't study anything like that. I only studied like the basics of the language because that was like where my level was. Um, and so the coding I think went okay. That might have been what saved me. The architecture was just a disaster. Um, and so, yeah, when they when they called me back, they were like, yeah, this is definitely an apprentice position. Um, so here's what that means, yada, yada, yada. So yeah, that was kind of, that was kind of how that went. Um, so when you were focusing on like teaching yourself, did you find a person or multiple people that helped mentor you? Or were you fully just like teaching yourself? Um, before I, before the apprenticeship, I was able to find um, a couple. Um, it wasn't the, it wasn't super intense, but it was, I, 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 I do remember they were actually all iOS developers um, because at the time I was focused on, I wanted to be an iOS developer. Um, and so a lot of their, like honestly, most of their mentorship was about like the build process and Xcode and just like all of these things, all of these incidental things about building iOS apps that are like really tricky if you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. So that was super helpful because with their help, I was able to actually like finish a basic iOS app. Um, and so, yeah, I think, and, and, and I, I met those people purely through my, my networking. It's like, oh, you want to be an iOS developer? I know an iOS developer. Here, I'll, I'll show you. Um, so yeah, not a ton, but, uh, but there was some for sure. When I was at Trunk Club, that was when, um, you know, the world really opened up mentor wise because there were so many I was assigned a mentor, so there was someone's job was to mentor me, which was awesome. <laughs> um, I definitely took advantage of that once it uh, once it once it came. Okay, so and then there was actually from the previous question, there was a follow up. Uh, what did you mean about like the architecture in the example of mm. the interview? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, architecture is a super broad term, um, and I think architecture. When when someone says it's an architecture interview, that basically means we're going to hide all the all the information from you until you get in the room, and we're going to use our very specific uh, assessment criteria on some general problem. Um, so there isn't a, there isn't a lot of information in the name. Um, I. I vividly remember my two architecture interviews at trunk club the first one was um the first one was what happens when you type uh, a url into a browser window um which i believe my first response was uh i don't know like the website loads <laughs> and that wasn't what they were hoping to hear <laughs> um and then the second the second interview question was um, more domain modeling. So it was like, we're going to design a, a system for, we're going to build a video uh, a, a video store. So like a, like a Blockbuster or like a, a Redbox. And we're going to design, we're going to design the, the system um, to let people rent videos. So that was a more traditional, like, let's sort of, you know, talk through how we would build that system end to end. And I think the theme with a lot of these interviews is if you're in a coding interview, it's like, okay, how fluent are you with your tools? Um, and you know, how, how do you map your problem solving abilities into your, uh, the usage of your tools? 
on the other side, when you have like architecture style interviews, it's more of like, how well, how well do you understand how all of these pieces fit together? And if you're putting, you know, if you're putting one piece next to another, how would you do that optimally? Like what trade-offs are there depending on what it is? And, you know, what are the things that could go wrong there? And if they did go wrong, like, how would you, uh, how would you work around them? So kind of like, usually it's like, okay, there's going to be some kind of API that's involved. There's going to be some kind of business logic uh, area. There's going to be some kind of data store uh, that you're dealing with. And then how do we put all those pieces together? Um, in the more advanced interviews, it can be like, you know, how do we get multiple system, multiple end-to-end -end systems to to uh, to cooperate? Um, but I think for the more um, junior level role, it's probably typically going to be something along the lines of like, okay, I have user input coming in one end, and then I'm accepting that input, I'm uh, doing things with it, and then I'm saving it, and then returning results back. So it's like, how do all those pieces fit together? If that makes sense. Awesome, thank you. This question is, how important is a degree versus some certificate versus proven shared experience, like on GitHub? Hmm. So it, the, the answer very, very much depends on, on who you're asking. Um, there are you know, there are openings out there that require a CS degree and they don't budge on that. They, you know, they, there's a lot of like formal computer science know-how that goes into the job. And so that's why they require something like that. Um, there are other places where uh, formal computer science knowledge is less important to the job. And so that's kind of a whole other area and that's really case specific. Um, what, what I think, um, I don't have a computer science degree. Um, and I would say that I do think computer science, the discipline is, I, I do think that it plays an important role in your career as you advance. Um, however, I don't think that the best way to get a job in the industry is to go get a computer science degree necessarily. Um, and I think the industry in general is kind of dealing with that uh, trade-off right now. Um, but I think if there was, if there's any body of knowledge that exists in the world that you can get uh, for free, it's basically computer science. I mean, there are all these other skills um, that are that have not quite had the leg up onto the onto the internet that computer science has had. So um, I think computer science is important, and I think that it it can be a good a uh, good differentiator, uh, especially if you are in a more junior role. Um, but it's definitely not like necessary. Um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I think. There were a few other like parts. It was like what. Um, it wasn't just computer science. It was like a couple other things too. Sorry, yeah, let me find it again. Um, yeah, so degree versus certificate versus oh. proven experience on GitHub or wherever you're. Right. Yeah, I mean, proven experience, like if you can get proven experience with it, then that would be my route. Um, if you can say like, hey, I'm really passionate about this this personal project that I've been working on, you know, for my for myself. And, you know, I came I came into these performance issues and I found these N plus one queries and I, you know, I optimized them. Like, you know, that's a great inroad into, you know, being able to demonstrate that you can think um, theoretically about things like how long it takes to compute something and stuff like that. Like if you're if you're worried about things like performance and you can demonstrate that, that's awesome. Um, the certificates, I think um, the certificate's okay as long as you can make sure that it's actually helping you as a programmer. Um, I've done computer science courses and I've done certificates and I was not super vigilant about making sure that what I was learning was 
actually applicable to what I was to what I was working on. Um, and I think it's very rare that you interview somewhere and they only talk to you about textbook computer science. Like, and I also think it's very rare that even if they do, I think it's rare that they will hire you if you only have that and you don't have really, really good programming skills. Um, so I think the certificate's fine as long as uh, you make sure that you're able to apply it. Because there's so much, uh, there's there's so many topics in computer science and they're all fascinating intellectually. Um, I'm a sucker for it personally. Like I will, I love reading about uh, concepts that do not apply to the projects that I'm working on. I do that all the time. But um, but yeah, if uh, if the goal is to strengthen your um, your candidacy, I would say definitely make sure that you're tying things together. Um, I just found out about this resource. I don't know if anyone already knows about it, but you can enter a URL and see it, it'll rate the performance and accessibility, um, other best practices and how SEO compatible it is. Um, so that that could be something interesting to look at if you're working on a project that's deployed somewhere and you want to start getting some metrics maybe for your resume. Anyway, next question. How would you start, how would you approach searching for your first dev job in 2020? Good question. Um, so with this, going back to my experience, I take, take this answer with a, with a, with a, a small grain of salt because it's been, it's been a while since I've, since I've done that. Um, but what I would say is with, with all things that not everything falls under your control, like with anything that involves you applying somewhere or like there has to be like for you to get a job, there has to be an opening for starters. Right. And the requirements have to have to match with what you're uh, offering. Right. So there's so many variables there that I would say, um, approach it with, um, be patient and be persistent. And one thing that I found was that I saw zero results for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then out of the blue, you know, an, an opportunity just like appeared. Right. And so I had no evidence that what I was doing was working at all. So it was just like, Am I just wasting time? Um, I have no idea. I was lucky to only have to do that for three weeks because if I had gone for like six weeks, maybe I would have just gotten uh, wiped out and just convinced myself that it wasn't a good strategy, right? But the reason that I kept going was that it, even if it wasn't make, giving opportunities, it was still a valuable thing to be doing. So the reason I really like networking is that even if someone might not have an opportunity for you right now, um, or they might not be able to help you right now, um, there's still uh, there's still a valuable contact to have. And so, I would say that whereas if you are just applying blindly to jobs and you're not hearing back from your applications and you're not talking to human beings, you're just getting automated email messages, etc. Um, that stuff I think can wear you down over time. Because um, if if you don't get uh, an interview, then and you don't meet anyone or talk to anyone that works there, like it's hard to get value from. So I think applying is probably fine, and it's it's probably easy enough to do and to do in a pretty high volume too. But at the same time, I I'm a big believer in just reaching out to people, um, and you would be surprised like. If you reach out to someone who has never met you before, doesn't know anything about you, and they don't reply back, if you send one follow-up message, usually they will reply because they will say, oh my gosh, like this person wasn't just spamming their whole LinkedIn contact list. 
they reached out to me with a specific reason and then they followed up because I didn't reply like Okay, we're back. Sorry for interrupting you. Do you remember what you were saying? Um, <laughs> um, I was just rambling on about something. Um, okay. Yeah. I think I was yeah. just talking about how I was a big fan of like reaching out to people as a way to 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 get jobs. I mean, it the, the thing is, it takes a long it takes a much longer time than just applying and getting an answer within three days, right? Um, yeah, you, you so, definitely gotta have patience. 